So today we wrap up our series in 1 Timothy. We're going to look at this last section of this letter that Paul wrote to the young pastor Timothy. And it's clear in the end of this letter, this is a call to action. It's a very passionate call to action as we look at these last verses. Uh, this last section, a whole chapter 6 really, is filled with action verbs. And this section that we're going to look at today, beginning in chapter 6, verse 11, begins with two very clear calls to action, with the words flee and pursue. Chapter 6, verse 11, but it's for you, O man of God, and even there there's a passion to it. In the Greek, this uh, interjection that's translated O. Oh. Whenever you see that in Paul's writing, it's usually just because he's trying to drive in great passion into what he's saying. And here he says, O oh, man of God, the phrase man of God there, only appears here in the New Testament, that title. It appears several times in the Old Testament when God calls a man to shepherd his people. But only here is it applied in the New Testament. And, and Paul is saying to, again, this young pastor Timothy passionately, O oh, you man of God, you one called by God to shepherd his people. Flee these things. And he refers back to the things that Brandon talked about last week. Those things that could be so destructive to his life and to the church. Things like the love of money, the unhealthy craving for controversy, this desire to somehow get caught up in meaningless debate. Things that divide the church like envy and dissension, slander, evil suspicion, constant conflict. Paul says, flee those things. Those are dangerous things. Run, run with your, like your life depends upon it, away from those things. But Paul doesn't just stop there. Avoiding and repudiating those things that are bad is important. But Paul now is going to call him to much more, to pursue things. He passionately, again, calls Timothy to pursue several things. The word pursue there is to strive towards, to chase, to get in... It's a very intense word. It's not just walk after, it's run after these things. One of my favorite uh, writers is the British pastor John Stott. When he was talking about this passage that we're going to look at today, he wrote this. There's no particular secret to learn, no formula to recite, no technique to master. The apostle gives us no teaching on holiness and how to attain it. We are simply to run from evil as we run from danger and to run after goodness as we run after success. That is, we have to give our mind, time, and energy to both flight and pursuit. Once we see evil as the evil it is, we'll want to flee from it. And once we see goodness as the good it is, we will want to pursue it. In other words, if we would just become more aware and more attentive to the pain and the destruction, the dehumanization, uh, the death and disease that is a result of evil in our world. If we saw the impact that evil was having in our own lives and in the lives of others, and in the world around us, the ugliness that is the result of evil, he's saying if we would just be more attentive to that and aware of that, we would not want evil to have any victory in our lives and in the world around us. We would, we would long for evil to be destroyed and conquered by the power of Christ because we would just see the harm and the ugliness caused by it. But just as true, he is saying, if we were more aware of the goodness in our world that is here because of God and his presence and his work, if we were just more attentive to the beauty around us that has the fingerprints of God on it, if we are more aware of the impact of love, if we were more aware of the power of the gospel and how lives are changed by it, if we were more attentive to that and aware of that, we would want to chase after, pursue, run hard after the goodness of God and proclaim it every chance we get because it is so good and so beautiful and so life-changing that our problem sometimes is we're just not aware of how ugly evil is and how incredibly good the goodness of God is. So here, Paul is call, calling Timothy to chase after, to join in this goodness of God. And here's some specific ways he calls him to do it. He tells him to pursue righteousness. When that word appears in the New Testament, it usually just means it's right behavior, it's right conduct. 
It's doing the right things. Things that are uh, in line with the will of God and the word of God. But it really is more than just outward conduct. It's about doing right things for the right reason and the right way. And like all Christian virtues, all these graces that we will look at that Paul is calling Timothy to pursue, they're all things that depend upon the transforming power of Christ in our lives. They're not things we can do on our own. And I also want to make really clear, these are not this righteousness that Timothy is called to pursue. It's not righteousness so that he might be acceptable in the sight of God, that he might somehow earn relationship with God. That's already been accomplished in Christ. Christ, his righteousness that was credited to us when we placed our faith in him. Instead, this is about embracing, about taking hold of the righteousness that is now ours in Christ because of what he's done for us and reflecting that to the world around us. The second thing that Timothy's called to pursue is godliness, and that overlaps some with righteousness. It's about godly, godlike behavior, but it seems to include a little more this posture towards God. Not just behavior, but behavior that's driven by this this posture that we have towards our God, one of reverence and one of respect and devotion. It highlights that, I think, a bit more. It's the conduct that's driven by our belief in and our reverence towards God and how that is reflected in the choices we make. The third thing that Timothy's called to pursue is faith. Fortunately, Hebrews 11.1 defines faith for us. It says, the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Paul's calling Timothy here to pursue, to chase after hard, um, this deeper trust in God. It's that beautiful last song that we heard, to believe him, to believe that what he has said, to believe that what he has said he has done and what he will do, to believe him about who he is, that's faith. And he says, chase after that hard. Chase after believing that even the things that you can't quite see, the things you can't touch, that those things are true because your God has told you they are true. But faith is about more than just believing. It's also about participating in it. Faith is about stepping out and risking depending upon what God has said is true. And then he talks about love. And Paul often joins faith and love in his writings because it's out of that belief that what God has said is true. That even if I can't see it, even if I can't touch it, I believe it because God has said it. Love is now how we go live that out. If I'm going to participate in what God has said is true, I'm going to go out and love. And I'm going to love because I believe what God has said. That I'm taken care of by him. That I can believe that God, I am secure in his hands. My future is secure for eternity because of him and what he's done through Jesus Christ. And now I'm free to love the other, to sacrifice for the other, to care for the other, to to not worry so much about me, and to now start turning outward and giving my attention to the other. Faith that leads to love. He tells them to pursue steadfastness. It's a word that means perseverance, patience, endurance, uh, a kind of dependability. It's often been said that the Christian life is kind of like trying to go up the down escalator. You really don't have a choice to stand still, right? You either move forward or you start going backwards. This is steadfastness. It's always following, always moving forward towards our God. And then the final word, the final thing that Timothy is called to pursue is gentleness. Uh, To quote John Stott again, he says, Steadfastness is patience in difficult circumstances. And gentleness is patience with difficult people. Um, That second one's generally the harder one. (laughs) Patience with difficult people. It's the opposite of an overbearing attitude. Many people think of gentleness as weakness. But boy, you sure don't find that in Scripture, do you? When you look at Jesus and his gentleness, it is incredible strength. But it's incredible strength that is also joined together with empathy and sensitivity. That's gentleness. So he's called to righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness, to pursue these things. And then Paul, with those in mind, says, Timothy, in verse 12, go fight the good fight of the faith. Go fight this good fight. And again, sometimes people take those words in Scripture, those fight words, battle words, 
And they use them to justify sometimes aggressiveness and anger and even violence, sometimes in the pursuit of truth or the defense of what is just. But understand that here, he is telling them intensely to pursue something, to fight hard for something. But he's telling them to fight the good fight, the good fight of the faith. And it's a fight that includes all those things that he's just been called to pursue. This is a fight we fight with love. This is a fight we fight with gentleness. This is a fight we fight depending upon the power of God, not human power, not our own power. Psalm 27 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. It's that kind of fight that follows him and depends upon him, not upon the power that we have or the others in our world have. It's upon the power of God. And then he says it in another way. Fight the good fight of the faith. He also says, take hold of eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession. Probably talking about Timothy's confession that he made at his baptism. When he confessed Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. He said, you made that good confession, Timothy. Now go out and grab hold of that eternal life that is yours because of Jesus Christ. Not go out and get something you don't have. Take hold of what you now have in Christ. Don't believe this lie that nothing has really changed. You are a new creature in Christ. And now, death can never defeat, never conquer, because you now have eternal life. Forever, you get to live this life, this new life as a new creature because of what Christ has done. Take hold of that. Embrace it. Live as if that is true, because it is the truth. Eugene Peterson um, wrote this, when we submit our lives to what we read in Scripture, we find that we are not being led to see God in our stories, but our stories in God's. Let me say that again. When we submit our lives to what we read in Scripture, we find that we are not being led to see God in our stories, but our stories in God's. God is the larger context and plot in which our stories find themselves. I think that's what Paul's calling Timothy to do. To always remember that you are now a part of this bigger story, God's story. Don't get lost in just the things you see, the things you touch, the things you have control over. Remember now you have an eternal life that is in the presence of God, that is following after your God, that he's leading the way. Live that life. Take hold of it. Now Paul knows, as he goes on, that Timothy's going to, face some pretty major challenges. He knows their hard things ahead because Paul has walked that same path. He knows what's coming for him, and it's pretty rough at times. The temptations he's going to face, the challenges, he knows that our enemy Satan is going to throw at him every possible uh, distraction, every possible temptation, everything that could get him to go off track. So Paul wants to let him know, to encourage him as he now pursues this and fights this good fight. He tells them that, Timothy, remember, you made this good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Let's remind Timothy, the choices you now make, they impact others. You've made these, these, this commitment to Christ before other people. Remember, you're not in this by yourself, which means two things. You make choices to fall away, to follow after Satan, to let him distract you. Others fall with you. You impact the lives of others. But also, I think, to remind Timothy, you don't walk this path by yourself. There are others there you can lean on and depend upon to encourage you and to strengthen you. This isn't just you. You've made it before many witnesses. We're in this together. I can tell you, I've loved watching this church recently. Uh, I'm still fairly new here. But in the two years even I've been here, I've loved watching this church Rally around people in our church. Rally around people in need, people in loss, people in struggle, people in hardship. Come alongside and remind each of us, whether we're the ones that are being supported or we're just seeing others being supported, reminding us we're not in this by ourselves. And Paul tells Timothy, you made this confession before many witnesses. Hold on to that. But he also goes on in verse 13, and he says, I charge you. This phrase is almost like Paul has taken Timothy by the shoulders. 
And he's looking in his eyes and he's shaking him and saying, I charge you. There's an intensity to this phrase. Timothy, I charge you. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. I am charging you, Timothy, to walk this path, to fight this good fight. Not just me, though. We are, we are doing this in the presence of God, the life giver, the creator, the one who breathed life into everything that, that has life. He is with us. You're doing it before him. Remember that. You're not alone in this. It's before him. He is with you. Again, encouragement, but also challenge. This is for him. And he is so deserving of your loyalty and your devotion and your commitment. But also between, before Jesus Christ, who when Pontius Pilate asked him, are you king of the Jews, responded, yes, it's as you say. I am the king of the Jews. I am the Messiah that all the prophets have pointed to and promised. I am the Lord, the King and the Savior. Yes, you're making this commitment also before him, and I am charging you before him, the one so deserving of your devotion, to fight the good fight. And remember, he is with you as you fight that good fight. He goes on in verses 14 through 16. Again, I charge you. I charge you to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Man, what a reminder, right? What a reminder, this fight we fight. We fight it with that God, that God, that all-powerful King of kings and Lord of lords, the one who is immortal, the one who is, lives in unapproachable light, he is the one who leads this battle. We don't fight this by ourselves. He is the one that we serve, the one so deserving. And he says, really in a sense, stay in the fight, Timothy. There are times when I'm in the fight, just like all of us, and I get so frustrated that I can't see the end. I get so frustrated. It's like, I have fought long enough. There should be results today. Things should be changing. And I think Paul is reminding Timothy, when you hit those moments, remember, that the final victory is in the hands of our Lord. He will pick the time. He will pick the place. He will pick how this happens. That's not in our hands. That's not ours. He is so worthy of being trusted with this. We need to trust him with it. Our job? Stay in the fight. Our job is take hold and keep holding on. Fight the good fight of the faith. Even when we're not sure when the end comes. Because the one who's going to bring that final victory, boy, he is so worthy of our trust. Then for a moment, Paul shifts back in this passage. He's been calling him to move ahead. Now he shifts back to a warning again. And I think it's interesting the warning he shifts back to. Uh, he readdresses a danger that he needs to run away from. In verse 17, he's now calling Timothy to call others to run away from this threat that he's called him to run away from earlier. Verse 17, he says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, nor on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. I mean, it just strikes me that this love of money is so dangerous that in this final charge, this intense, passionate charge that he's giving to Timothy, he starts by warning about love of money. He comes back again and says, warn everybody else about the love of money. This is so dangerous. This is so dangerous to the individual believer. This is so dangerous to the church. Timothy warned them. And the danger is that it is so tempting when we have those resources in our own hands to believe that somehow we can meet our own needs. Somehow we can live the life that we really want to live because I've got it in my hands. I have the power to provide for myself now. He says, warn them. Warn them that is a dangerous thing to start believing that somehow life's in your control that you don't depend upon God for the things you truly long for and the things you truly need. 
maybe a good question to ask ourselves every so often, just to stop and kind of take a look at what do we really put our hope in? Every so often, just ask yourself, what, what dream stirs the most hope in you? The dream of somehow tomorrow falling into unbelievable amounts of money? A huge inheritance, you won the lottery, I don't know, something. Huge amounts of money. What's that stirring you? Or the dream of walking really close to God in a way you never have before. Which one stirs the most hope in you? Which one do you think about and think, oh, life would be so good? Right? Paul is saying, the only one that truly will provide for you that what you hope for is walking close to God, following after him, fighting the good fight. And I love in this passage, he says, the God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Don't you sometimes think God just wants to give us what we need to sustain us? That's not what he's saying here. Hold on. Fight the good fight. Chase after. Because this God actually loves to richly bless you with those things that you truly long for, the things you truly enjoy. He is such a good God. Then verse 18 uh, to 19, he moves from flee to pursue again. He's talking about this love of money. But again, not just about running from. That's important. But what do you pursue? How do you really fight that fight well? They're to do good in verse 18. To be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Thus storing up treasures for themselves is a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Don't you love that phrase? Take hold of that which is truly life. How do you do that? You run from the love of money. Again, seems to be a huge danger. But you run towards, do good. Join the good that God is doing. Be people who are generous and live, in, live life in a generous way, which means I don't have to hold on to these things so tightly. I have them, but they're a way that God has blessed me and I now get to bless others. Join what God is doing. Don't be someone who holds on to those things as somehow the source of life. Because money's slippery, he's telling us. It is, a, it is an untrustworthy thing to hold on to and try and find life in. Instead, depend upon your God, your provider. He is the generous one, and he is the one who will always provide for us what we truly need and long for. And that's the path, he tells us, to the life that is truly life now and for eternity. Now he has one last uh, charge to give to Timothy uh, in verses 20 to 21. Actually, before I go there, one other thing I just want to highlight and say. When you think about the, the danger of the love of money, I was just thinking the other day when I was working through this, you know, when I hear people talk about all the dangers in our world, the, what evil is doing in the world around us, and all the things we fear, all the things we like, oh, just look at how evil is prospering and winning and how we hate that and it stirs just frustration in us and anger and sometimes fear. I seldom hear people say, oh, and I'm so worried about the way wealth is becoming the thing we're depending upon so much. I seldom hear that being the big danger everybody's worried about. Too much wealth and clinging to it, Right? This seems to be something Paul's saying, be careful. Not because you have wealth, wonderful resource that can do incredible things. It has been such a blessing to watch the people of this church in recent weeks love a member of our church, a family in our church, by being generous with the things they have. All right? What a, what a blessing that has been. That is a wonderful view of money, of resources. They're a way to bless. But man... It is a dangerous thing when we start seeing that as the source of life. And he's warning us, warning us hard, passionately. Be careful about that. And really, if you think about it, compared to the rest of the world, most of us here are wealthy. We are wealthy people. We always think of wealthy as somebody else. Most of us here are at risk of clinging to those kind of resources and think they're going to be the source of life and chasing after them instead of after God. Now to verse 20 and 21. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid irrelevant babble and contradictions of what, what is falsely called knowledge. 
for by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. And again, I think Paul is talking to Timothy from experience. I've seen people fall away because of falling into the trap of things that are falsely called knowledge and believing them. Now, he's not telling Timothy knowledge is dangerous. It's what's falsely called knowledge is dangerous. Think about all the ways today that people can get access to your thoughts. All the ways that people can speak something as truth to you. It is unbelievable the, the ways people have access to me today. Right? I mean, just in my lifetime, how much that has changed. You know, there was a time when you know, I'd call somebody, I'd leave a voicemail, hope they someday get it. You know? And they half the time pretend they didn't. You know, because... That's really the only way I can get a hold of them. I have to put a stamp on a letter and mail it to them. I could drive over and see them. Think today of all the ways people get access to you. Think of the billions of dollars that are spent by advertisers to get just a little moment of your attention, just to grab a little bit of your thinking. Think of the huge industry that is focused on just getting a little bit of your thoughts. Thousands and thousands of ways every week that messages are being thrown at us. Paul is warning Timothy to warn others also. Be careful about that. There are times we need to run away from that. Now, we live in a world where that's going to keep happening, right? That's not going away. But we can't be wise about it. Be careful how much you're letting those messages dominate your thinking. Those messages that are often unfiltered, uh, Nobody's really looking at them, checking them. They're just being thrown out as truth. Be careful about that. But I think Paul is also telling them, again, not just run from, but here's something you chase after. Chase after the truth. Guard the deposits that's been entrusted to you, he tells them. And that would be those Holy Spirit-inspired words that Paul has passed on to Timothy, the Word of God, the words we now have in our Bibles the Word of God. Guard those. Hold on to those. Trust in that deposit. So flee from these, what's called false knowledge, but pursue truth. Immerse yourself in God's Word. Study it. Sit under the teaching of godly men and women. Sing the truth. Listen to it. Apply it. Immerse yourself in God's truth. It's our greatest protection against false knowledge. Make sure that we are constantly hearing that. Uh, and not just receiving all these un other messages without thought. Now, I do want to add, protecting truth is not the same thing as protecting the views you've always had or the things that you've always believed. Sometimes I think we fall into that trap. I'm, I'm guarding the truth, which means anything that is my preference, anything that's my tradition, I'm guarding the truth. I don't think that's what Paul's saying here. I think what Paul is saying here is make sure that you guard that deposit, the Word of God, which means the Word of God ought to be continually shaping our thinking. We ought to be growing in our understanding of it. We sometimes ought to be making changes because we have come to understand the Word of God. All change is not good. Sometimes those changes we're being called to are by false knowledge. But also be careful that you're not thinking you're protecting the Word of God when sometimes really what you're protecting is your preference or your tradition. That also can be false knowledge. So I want to wrap up with this. Three words. I want to leave you with three words to maybe think about this week and hopefully apply some of this. Three words to consider as we seek to take hold of the life that is truly life. First word, worship. Remember the words from John Stott that I shared at the beginning? Once we see evil as the evil it is, we'll want to flee from it. And once we see goodness as the good it is, we'll want to pursue it. I think the power to flee the right things and pursue the right things really begins with worship. It begins by identifying what really is the work of evil and what really is the goodness of God. Uh, and worship is one of the ways that we draw our attention back to God, who he truly is. And really at the core of worship, the foundation of worship is always awe and gratitude. It is awe at the fact that we serve a powerful God, a majestic God. 
And it is gratitude because we have a God who is merciful and gracious and loving and generous towards us. Awe and gratitude, always part of our worship. And worship isn't just what we do here on Sunday. We have the opportunity to worship every day. Uh, when we stop and we allow ourselves to experience and express the awe of as we stand before a powerful God and to express gratitude for the goodness of our God. So I would say start there. And by that I mean this week, um, as you move out into your lives, be a little more attentive to the goodness of God that you experience and see around you. Pay a little more attention to it. When you encounter beauty, remind yourself that, that the source of that is our God. Beauty only exists because of our God. His fingerprints are all over it if we stop and pay attention to it. When someone blesses you and does good towards you, remember the source of love, the source of all goodness is our God. Stop and just reflect on it for a moment. When you encounter those little tastes of goodness, maybe it's the laughter of a child, right? Maybe it's the leaves turning and as fall comes. When you encounter those things, stop for a moment and just reflect on it. Those are only possible and only here because of my good God, because of his presence, because of his goodness. When you encounter somebody, another person, just stop and think for a minute, where do I see the image of God reflected in them? Even if I don't like them, where do I see the image of God reflected in them? Again, where is there something of God that I can stop and be grateful for, reflect on. And then, as you see those things, I would say stop and just for a moment express your gratitude to him. Worship him as a source of all that is good. But also, I would say this week, take some moments to reflect upon his power and upon his majesty and upon his authority. That We have a good God, but we also have a powerful God. On Christmas 2021, just a few years ago, a rocket took off from French Guiana and it was carrying the James Webb Telescope, that thing. That thing cost over $10 billion to build, believe it or not. Uh, it was sent into space that day because it's now out in space and it's to replace the Hubble Telescope. They said that telescope is supposed to be 100 times more sensitive than the Hubble. It says it can pick up light that has traveled across space, it, it is so sensitive, it will pick up light that has traveled 13 billion light years. Now think about that for a second. That is light that has traveled 186,000 miles per second, which is 5.88 trillion miles per year. 13 billion times 5.88 trillion, that's how many miles that light has traveled that this telescope is sensitive enough to pick up. Think about that distance. Think about how unbelievably huge the universe is that God spoke into existence. Our powerful, majestic God spoke it into existence, sustains it every moment. It ceases to exist apart from him. Just this week, someone shared this quote from Charles Spurgeon with me. The same God who guides the stars in their courses, who directs the earth in its orbit, who feeds the burning furnace of the sun and keeps the stars perpetually burning with their fires, the same God has promised to supply thy strength. Stop for a moment when you reflect upon the power and the majesty and the greatness of our God. Praise him. Just take a moment to praise our great and majestic and powerful God when you remember who he truly is. Even if it's beyond our understanding, when you encounter it, when you have that experience of awe, just stop and put some words to it before our God. Worship him. Second word I want to draw your attention to, first worship, second, assess. That's not a really... Uh, powerful word to hold on to, but do a little assessment uh, in the next week or so. Do assessment of those things that you are chasing after. And I'd say the way you do that is take a look at your schedule. End of the week, look back. Take a look at how you spent your time, where you're, where you're investing, the things you're chasing after with your, the resource of time. 
Take a look at how you spent your money over the last week or month or year. Where's your money going? Again, what are you truly chasing after? Think about the things you read and watch and listen to. What are the things you are chasing after? Just do a little bit of self-assessment and ask, if I really look at it, what, what kind of rises to the top as the things that I'm truly chasing after? And then I would say, take that worship, those moments of worship, and take this self-assessment of what you're chasing after. Do these make sense together? Do these fit together very well? If this is true, if this is the God that I am, I am now in relationship with and called to follow, does this make sense? And, if, and as we ask that question, I think for all of us, we'd say, eh, often no. Often it doesn't make sense. I live, I live as if this is not true many times, as if everything that I long for and need and enjoy is somehow in my hands that I have to produce, that I would be the source of it. So as you worship, as you do a little self-assessment, then the third word, now, pursue. Now decide, what do you want to chase after? In the light of those things, what makes sense to chase after? How do you want to join the good fight of the faith? And I'd be real specific about it. Not just general, real specific. What are some things that you'd say, those are some things I need to really more intentionally chase after in my own life so that I can join well the good fight of the faith? Here are the things, again, that uh, Paul called Timothy to pursue, to chase after. Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. In another letter, Paul uses the metaphor of taking off and putting on instead of fleeing and pursuing. In Colossians 3, he tells the readers in Colossae, put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, forgiveness, and love. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. I would say think about those lists. Think in your life, how might God be calling you to chase after the life that is truly life? What are some things that you could be more intentional about and more intense about in your pursuit of joining him in that good fight of the faith? A fight that he has already guaranteed the victory in. How do you join him in that? The truth is, if we're not attentive to what we're chasing after, all of us just start moving with traffic. It's what we all do, right? Uh, you really have to be intentional about it. Where are you going? What are you chasing after? Where is this taking you? Be intentional about it because, man, I don't want my life to just be about moving with traffic. Finally, I just want to remind you, this is a call to action. Uh, this is not just a call to identify what's wrong out there and be able to point at it and say, I don't like it, it's horrible, it's ugly, want it destroyed. Not enough. This passage is also about pursue the good, chase after the good. I used to have a professor, and one of his favorite illustrations was he would often talk about uh, holiness. And he would, he would uh, describe holiness by saying, have you ever gone on a hike and... Um, some beautiful place where nature around you just is captivating. It's just beautiful. You're just in awe of the beauty and the creation around you, and you're hiking along that trail, and all of a sudden you come upon where someone has dumped garbage on the trail ahead of you. You know that feeling you have in that moment? The feeling of this violation of what is good and beautiful. It just disgusts me. It is horrible. Oh, it's just not the way it should be. But he says, you know what real holiness is? It's bending over and picking up the trash and strapping it to your backpack and carrying it out. It's not just disgust at what's wrong. It's also saying, I want to chase after the good. I want to join God in his good work of bringing beauty where there's brokenness, of bringing good where evil thinks it's going to have a victory. We defeat it by following our good God and chasing after the good. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful that we serve a good and a powerful God. 
Father, I know there are people right here today who probably feel like giving up. Uh, Father, who feel like at times, is, um, is this fight worth fighting? Uh, is it really worth taking hold of the things you call us to take hold of? I pray you'd remind us often uh, that you would clear our minds and help us to see how truly good you are, how truly powerful you are. That following you is really, truly the only path to life. We thank you that we, we can, that because of Jesus Christ, we have a relationship with you and the ability to follow after you and join with you. Uh, thank you, God. In your blessed name we pray, amen.